What's going on guys? Today I'm going to be talking about a very famous mathematician, scientist and an Islamic scholar that is Inayatullah Khan Mashriqi, prominently known as Allama Mashriqi. Allama Mashriqi broke multiple records at the University of Punjab and Cambridge Universities. Furthermore, he established a social movement called the Kaksas Movement which was founded in 1931. In addition, he played a very crucial role in the independence of Indo-Pakistan. Early life of Alama Mashriqi Alama Mashriqi was a son of Khan Atta Muhammad Khan that had a distinguished personality. He was born in Amritsar, India. He authorized poetry and many books in prose which were well recognized. Mashriqi's mother was a very well educated and religious person. Inayatullah Khan was born in Amrita, India on 25th August 1888 in a Punjabi Rajput family and died in Lahore, Pakistan on 27th August 1963. Mashriqi was born with an intelligent mind and during his school years he obtained several scholarships and distinction in his class. By achieving this, it could be seen that he would become a great scholar and a leader. After his extraordinary performance at the FC College and Punjab University, he left Lahore for England to continue his higher education at the University of Cambridge. While spending time in Cambridge, Mershikri realized that Indians lived in poverty and were ruled by foreigners. In order to change this, he knew that something had to be done to extinguish this problem. Alama Mashriqi completed his education in 1912. He then spent a couple of months in Europe. During this time, he was offered a position of the Premier of Alvar in India, which came with a high paid salary and fringe benefits by the Maharaja of Alvar. However, Mashriqi respectfully rejected the offer. Mashriqi was very disturbed with the living state of Muslims in India. He had restless nights as a result of his concern. At this point of time, Mashriqi's aim was to join the education department so that he would be able to construct the character of the youth and instill them with the true values and teachings of his religion. Mashriqi went back to India in January 1913 and became the vice principal of Islamia College in Peshawar. In 1920, Mashriqi started awe-inspiring work, Tazkira, a commentary of the Holy Quran, which he completed this in 1924. Moreover, Mashriqi established the Kaksa Foundation in 1930 to eradicate poverty, reform society and bring freedom to India. He believed that everyone is equal in society regardless of their creed, color or religion. Moving on to the powerful message of Alama Mashriqi. In 1930, Alama Mashriqi resigned from government service, leaving behind his luxurious lifestyle, handsome salary and social position. Because he thought that as leader of a nation, living a luxurious life and his people living in poverty was not a fear to his nation. He started to live as a commoner and stopped wearing western style suits. Mashriqi ceased spending his money on luxury and comfort. Mashriqi laid the foundation for his Kaksar Tehreek to bring freedom in India and eliminate poverty. He wanted a society with peace and love to bring unite to bring unity in nation. Alama Mashriqi revolutionized the Muslims in India. He went to Lucknow in 1939 
to stop Shia and Sunni brawls, Mushriki was successful in this mission. However, he was under arrest whilst tried to intervene a settlement. Alama Mashaki was released from jail because of public pressure, but the government portrayed false news. The government made an apology letter and faked Mashriki's signature. When Mashriki heard about the fake published news, he went back to Lucknow, where once again Mashriki was arrested. Mashriki with extraordinary efforts for the Muslims helped to expand the Kaksa movement ideology. In 1939, the Kaksa movement reached unexpected levels which spread all over India. This was seen as a major threat and was an expansionism as no one has ever seen such a powerful political movement since the Kaksa movement. Moving on, the British felt scared and intimidated because of the way the movement was growing which was spread in every corner of India. They knew that this will cause a revolution. Because of this, the British forcibly put an end to Tehreek by restricting Mashriki's activities. Alama Mashriki went to Delhi to meet Viceroy Lord Linthlithgow and asked him to remove the restrictions which were on his activities. During his time, Mashriki met famous barristers, politi politician, and the founder of Pakistan, Qaid -e Azam, and other Muslim leaders. Alama Mashriki persuaded that the restrictions were not genuine and he did not do anything against the law. On the other hand, in 1940, the Kaksas movement paraded on the streets of Lahore and protest against the ban. During the protest, the Kaksas made their way to the famous Bashahi Mosque to pray. As the Kaksas marched through the streets, the police made an attempt to stop the Kaksas, but the police were unsuccessful to stop the brave and strong Kaksas and suddenly the police open fire on hundreds of innocent Kaksas, but the Kaksas did not stop. Whilst they were still marching through the streets, it could be seen the innocent Kaksas were being tortured and killed throughout. On March 19, Mushriki was under arrest again and the Kaksas was banned. A large protest took place against the massacre on Mashriki arrest on 21st March 1940. Qaid-e-Azam went to the hospital to visit the tortured and victimized Kaksas and expressed his feelings. On 24th March 1940, Jinnah told print media the Muslim League will make significant decisions to transform Pakistan in the upcoming sessions. He also visited the Bad Shahi Mosque and Lahore Fort which was filled with 100,000 people who attended the march. On the same day, the Kaksas commanded for independent investigation of the incident and the removal of the ban on the Kaksa which was passed. Unfortunately, a dreadful incident occurred on 31st March 1940. Ehsanullah Khan Aslam, who was a son of Alama Mashriki, died because of police aggression. Alama Mashriki wrote a heartfelt poem about his son where he expressed his feelings as the public found out about the death of Ehsan Ullah Khan Aslam. They were infuriated. Therefore, the protest against Mashriki's imprisonment continued. Nevertheless, the government still kept Mushriki imprisoned. During his time in prison, Mushriki was fasting. 
despite the protests still occurring, the government did not change their decision. Finally, after fasting until the last breath, Mushraki was released on 19th January 1942. Kaksa movement was not allowed to visit the Madras presidency where Mushriki stayed until December 1942. On 23rd March 1942, Sir Stafford Cripps went to New Delhi regarding the proposal of India's independence. Mushriki wrote a telegram to Sir Stafford Cripps in which he insisted the complete freedom of India. On 28th March 1942, Jinnah also commended the demand of the complete independence of India, whereas the Muslims, Mushriki and Kaksas were still working on the removal of the ban on the Tehreek. According to Eastern Times, Muslims insisted that the ban would be uplifted and the ban on Kaksas were removed on 28th December 1942. Mashriki went back to Lahore on 3rd January 1943 where the people of Lahore were pleased to see him and welcomed him. On 4th January 1943, Mashriki addressed the Kaksas after his arrival in Lahore. Alama Mashriki was working toward his goal which was to restart the Kaksas activities. However, during his time, they were under the British rule and many South Indians were integrated in a region called Madras Presidency. In 1956, the Madras Presidency was broke up and the Tamil Nadu was made. Mashraki came to know that if the issues between the Hindus and Muslims were not solved, then the freedom would not take place. Al Mashraki requested Jinnah and Gandhi to arrange a meeting where they would have a talk on the freedom of India. Mashraki had a sense that if both would come together and urge for freedom, then it would be unstoppable for the British to hold on to the power in India and they would win their fight for freedom. Alama Mashraki sent a telegram to Kaide Azam where he stated that Gandhiji's letter to you to meet him is indeed a prelude to the achievement of Pakistan as well as India's independence. I request you to reconsider the significance of his invitation. Out of nowhere, an unthinkable incident occurred where a Muslim attacked Jinnah and was alleged to be a Kaksar. Yet, this was a conspiracy by Mashraki's opposition so that they can divide the Muslims and finish the Kaksars politically. Although this incident took place, nonetheless, Mashraki still continued the efforts of him placing a meeting between Jinnah and Gandhi. On 2nd August 1944, the Tribune published an article stating Mushriki's letter to Jinnah, Kaksas anxious for Pakistan and freedom, and under the heading newspaper wrote, welcoming the forthcoming Gandhi Jinnah meeting. Mushriki also wrote, also wrote a letter to Mr. Jinnah stating, after anxious and patient moments of the last few weeks when I finally wrote to you, I have my utmost sincere appreciation that you have come forward to alter the destiny of India to something better and assure you again that I, along with every Kaksa that is in the land, will work with you in the full spirit of loyalty and friendship for the achievement of Pakistan and consequently the independence of India. I am also writing to Gandhi 
but these moves have cleared the tense atmosphere that existed. On this serious occasion in the history of India, I am proposing to order a batch of Katsars to reach Bombay and shall, if possible, reach Bombay myself for the purpose of begging you and Mr. Gandhi to reach a suitable settlement satisfactory to both parties. So then, on 29th August 1944, the Kaksars were fully concentrated in the meeting between Gandhi and Jinnah. The Kaksars were hoping that both tremendous and exceptional leaders would be on the same page on behalf of the people of India. The Kaksars met noticeable people such as Sir Karimboy Ibrahim and K. M. Munshi to advocate this meeting. Even though with Mashriki's hard efforts, the meeting failed on 27th September 1944. Mashriki again requested Gandhi and Jinnah to solve their issues. Mashriki gave Jinnah and Gandhi a deadline after in which he would have his own constitution for India. Jinnah and Gandhi did not reunite and with such great hard work, Mashriki did indeed produce the Constitution of Free India, which was published in 1945 in the Civil and Military Gazette. Alama Mashriki and his companions drafted the constitution and after on two legal committees were appointed to do more work on it. He planned a constitution that would help India to be undivided and fulfill the needs of various communities but Gandhi despite felt that constitution was in favour of the Muslims and he rejected it. On the other hand, Sir Tej Bahadur Sapru came to Kaksa's headquarters and accepted it. Many Muslims, including the union, Unionists, were in favour of the constitution. Nonetheless, Mashraki still kept his ongoing efforts to keep India intact. However, it soon became obvious that partition was foreseeable. Al Mashriki knew that the partition was unavoidable and he would and he could sense that the Muslims would suffer from this if they did not stand together. The fight, struggle and death of Alama Mashriki. On second June nineteen forty seven the Mountbatten plan announced the creation of Pakistan. But Mashraki and the Kaksas protested because they were not happy about the area Pakistan was covering. However, Qaid Azam had accepted the Mountbatten plan on 9th June 1947. Mashraki said that even if the division of India had to take place, he wanted Balochistan, Sindh, Kashmir, NWFP, Assam and undivided Punjab and undivided Bengal with the provinces of UP and Bihar to be the least Pakistan of the Muslims. Mashraki had told Mr. Jinnah in 1942 that the present Pakistan of the two provinces 1400 miles apart could not last and this would result in the ruin of one crore Muslims and the complete decimation of five crore Muslims of remaining India. On the other hand, British authorities believed that Mashriki may plan to organize 
another movement against the unjustice partition plan or at least try to capture Delhi in order to extend the boundaries of Pakistan. On 11th June 1947, Alama Mashaki came along with a hundred Khaksars, but he was arrested and then released soon after in Delhi. Alama Mashaki asked 300,000 Khaksars to gather at the Khaksar camp in Delhi on 30th June 1947. In the announcement, he said that if the 300,000 Khaksar could not reach the camp, then he would abolish the Khaksar Tehreek. Only 70,000 to 80,000 Khaksar could gather due to restrictions which were obligatory by the government. The Khaksar Tehreek was disbanded on 4th July 1947. Mashaki said, about three and a half months ago, I announced that if three lakh of Khaksars could would not have rallied in Delhi, there would be no revolutionary power in the movement and therefore it would be necessary to disband it. Now, with the establishment of Pakistan, which has been bestowed upon Muslims by the British, the last hope that 10 crore of Muslims who have been divided in various parts would continue the struggle of freedom has been lost. I therefore disband the movement. The message of disbanding the Khaksa movement was announced in Jamia Mosque which is in Delhi and in front of 100,000 people. When people heard about the Khaksa movement being abolished, they were speechless, shocked and defeated with regret and sorrow. Alama Mashraki was very disappointed on losing major part of India, which the Muslims had ruled for almost 10 centuries. 10 centuries. Mashraki's vision of Pakistan was the whole India. He believed that since the British had taken India from the Muslims and since the Muslims had ruled it for almost thousand years, it was their inheritance and right to get it back. Mashraki felt that a separated Pakistan was impractical because the Muslims were not focused in one region. He recognized that since India was receiving a bigger portion of the land, the Hindus would try to dictate the Muslims in the area. Lastly, he was worried about the Muslims who would be left behind in India. It could be problematic for many Pakistanis to understand this because they may not feel a strong connection to the Muslims in India. But at the time, Muslims in all of India were united as one community. How could Mashriki possibly have been happy when his community was being torn apart and millions of his Muslim brothers and sisters were going to be separated and would have to live under Hindu rule. Pakistanis who saw the who saw the fall of East Pakistan in 1971 can share to Mashraki's sadness. The partition of India had a related effect, but there were celebrations for freedom and hope for a better future. Many were mournful and depressed that they were being divided from their families. Those who were left behind in India were unable to migrate to Pakistan also felt betrayed. Many Muslims were upset 
that they were losing a huge area of land to Hindu rule. Even with Mashriki's disappointment, he accepted the creation of a divided India. Nevertheless, he could not settle with the idea of the division of the Muslim provinces of Bengal and Punjab. Mashriki also believed that other parts of India, like Assam, should have been part of Pakistan. He mourned the injustice that was done to the Muslims through the partition plan and later through the Radcliffe Award. After the creation of Pakistan, Mashriki kept his efforts in various ways to remedy the injustice. But it was too late due to the partition. Mashriki could not get any support of the Pakistani government. He critic he his criticism of the partition plan was unfavorable for the Muslims, and it was criticized by the Muslim League at the time. Nonetheless, as the time slowly faded away, many people began to understand the mistakes that were made in the partition scheme. On 14th August 1947, Pakistan appeared on the map as an independent country. However, Mashriki was highly disturbed to see that Kashmir was not a part of Pakistan. Mashriki protested and asked the government of Pakistan to resolve the issues with the government of India. Mashriki also asked Pakistan government to make sure that the government of India did not take the issue of Kashmir to the United Nations. The reason is Mashriki believed that if the issue was taken to you to United Nations, then it would never be solved. It could be seen that Mashriki's warning once again proved correct and the issue of Kashmir still stands unresolved. On 31st October 1947, Mashriki started organizing the Muslims under the banner of the Islam League to protect the rights of Muslims in India, liberate Kashmir, and uplift the poor masses in Pakistan. Mashriki tried to manage his followers who were left behind in India against this act. And after knowing about the activities of Mashriki's followers in India, a very substantial number of them were arrested by the Indian government. Nehru appealed to the Pakistan government to take action against Mashriki. The Pakistani government immediately took action and banned any literature of the Islam League and made sure it was not distributed in Pakistan or India. In 1949, Mashriki sent a representation to the Secretary General of the United Nations. The representation dealt with the denial of human rights to the Muslims in India. He then planned on pleading the case in person to the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations in the United States. Mashriki wanted to show the current problem of Kashmir and the Muslims in India before the commission. He received a positive answer from the Human Rights Commission. Ex-Premier of Undivided Bengal, Hussein Shahid Suhadrari, was also going to accompany him to plead the case. Though, when Mashriki applied for a passport, uh, the, govern the governor of Punjab refused after a gap of one month. The decision by the government was widely regretted by the people. 
even though Pakistan had already been created, Mushriki was still not allowed to operate as a free man. The government kept a close eye on Mushriki and monitored his every move. On 2nd May 1950, Mushriki's house in Lahore was carefully searched. During the search, copies of the of the pamphlet Akri Umid and other literature of the Islam League were found and seized. On the same day, other places connected with the Islam League, Kaksas, they were also known as Razakars, were also raided. On 3rd October 1950, Mashriki and his two sons were arrested in connection with the pamphlet Khitab e Lahore. On 4th December 1950, the government issued a statement to the reporters banning an Islam League conference in Karachi. On 11th January 1951, Mashriki and the Razakas were arrested under the Punjab Public Safety Act in advance of the forthcoming elections in Punjab. The government had no justification to arrest them and did so and in order to prevent Mashraki and the Razakars from playing any part in the elections. While Mashraki was in jail, his son Majid Uddin Amjad died on 12th April 1951 and was buried in Mashraki's absence. Mushriki also wrote a poem in memory of Majid Uddin Amjad. Mushriki only came to know of his son's death when he was allowed to visit Lahore for two hours on 14th April 1951. Mushriki spent half a year in jail and his detention was extended for another six months. Despite the fact that his health was getting worse, on 11th July 1951, he wrote to the government stating that he hadn't committed any crime and that he was being kept in jail without a trial. He also informed the government that as a form of protest against his unjust imprisonment, he was fasting until they granted him his release. Because of fasting, Mashraki began to lose weight. On the other hand, in order to protect themselves, the government announced that Mashraki was in good health and that he had gained weight. People felt bitter about his arrest and constantly demanded his release. Public meetings, processions, demonstrations, as well as Mushriki Day was on held on 20th July and August 6, 1951. Mushriki, while still in jail, sent two telegrams to Liaquat Ali Khan pointing out that Nehru was delaying the settlement of the Kashmir issue and wrongly accusing Pakistan for aggression. Mushriki appealed to Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan to straight away ask India to move his forces from Kashmir. He felt that if India failed to withdraw its forces, Pakistan would need to launch a sudden and strong attack and seize Kashmir. According to him, it was the best psychological moment to capture Kashmir and as the issue was still afresh and Liaquat Ali Khan could mobilize world opinion in Pakistan's favor. As time went, Mashriki's health became so bad that he felt that he was going to die. On 18 August 1951, he sent his will to the bank. Four days later, on August 22nd, 
a senior officer of the jail said, in case of your death, probably even your dead body should not be handed and over and over you will be buried here. Regardless of his failing health, Mushriki offered his unconditional service to the Liaka Tali Khan in a curing Kashmir. Mushriki recognized that if the matter was delayed, Kashmir could be lost forever. Unfortunately, Mushriki was unable to resolve the issue with Liaqat Ali Khan. On 1st October 1951, in order to justify Mushriki's detainment, the government declared Mushriki to be an enemy of Pakistan. On 16 October 1951, Liaqat Ali Khan was murdered. It was suspected that the Khaksas committed the murder under Mushriki's command, but during that time, Mushriki was still in detention. Any inquiry linked to the incident proved that any suggestion that the Khaksas were concerned in a conspiracy to the murder the Prime Minister or to inspire said Akbar to do so can be definitely discounted. Even with the government's failure to connect Mashriki to Liaqat Ali Khan's murder or any other crime, Mashriki remained in prison. On 20th October 1951, Mashriki wrote to the newly appointed Prime Minister Khawaja Nazimuddin. In the letter, he enlightened Nazimuddin that as a gesture of goodwill towards the new government, Mashriki will abandon his fast. Even though Mashriki showed a gesture of goodwill, the new government didn't reciprocate Mashriki's gesture and kept him in jail. So it was decided that a habeas corpus petition petition was submitted. However, the government prevented Mushriki from completing the paperwork. In addition to preventing Mushriki from filing a habeas corpus peti petition, the government again extended his imprisonment for another six months on 28 December 1951. On 4 January 1952, a meeting of some prominent people was held in Karachi. The people at the meeting commanded Mashriki's release and issued a statement containing the signatures of many prominent figures, including GM Said, who is a political leader, a Kaksa at one time, and Minister of Education of Sindh in 1940, Ibrahim Jalis, and Pir Ilahi Baksh. Who is, an ex who is an ex-minister in the province of Sindh cabinet and salar e in, Instead of listening to the demand for his release, the Punjab government extended Mashriki's detention for another six months. But people were determined on putting pressure on the Punjab government. Therefore, another Mashriki day was observed and protests continued in various cities of the country. To push for Mashriki's release, a deputation of the Islam League men Khawaja Nazamuddin and Mia Mumtaz Muhammad Khan Doltana. Finally, on 31st March 1952, after his, de after his detention had been extended twice, a Hibis Corp Corpus petition for Lama Mashriki came up for hearing in the court of Muhammad Munir, Chief Justice of the Lahore High Court, Mr. Hussein Shahid Suharudri, Mahmoud Ali Kasuri, and Khawaja Abdul Rahim appeared at the hearing on Mashriki's behalf. But the Chief Justice rejected the Lama's petition on 30th May 1952. Nevertheless, the pressure on the government from Mashriki's release soon became 
too much to handle. A confidential report by the CID, Criminal Investigation Department, described that Alama was being no more a danger to public peace and tranquility. Mushriki was released from jail on 9th July 1952 and on 10th July 1952 he wrote a poem about his release. In the face of brutalities he faced in jail and the opposition from the government no one could stop Mushriki from working to achieve his goals. On August 20, 25th, 1952, Mushriki arrived in Karachi where Pir Ilahi Baksh, who was an ex-minister in the province of Sindh cabinet, received him. Mushriki went to Saudi Arabia to perform Hajj. When he returned to Karachi on 22nd September 1952, he was given a warm welcome. Here he addressed a large public gathering. He talked about Kashmir and other issues confronting the nation. According to the Civil and, Mil and Military Gazette, he fervently appealed to all political parties to issue differences and strengthen the hands of the government as the country was passing through a critical juncture. On 25th July 1953, Nehru arrived in Karachi to talk about Kashmir and canal water issues with Prime Minister Muhammad Ali Bogra. Mashriki also wanted to talk about issues with Nehru. He sent a telegram to Nehru earlier to his arrival saying, We Muslims know that these are matters of life and death for us. But the government prevented Mashriki from meeting Nehru. On 25th and 26th November 1955, Mashriki appeared on two conferences on Kashmir in Karachi. The first conference on 25th November addressed by Lama Mashriki, Sardar Ibrahim and other leaders was held under the joint auspices of the Jummu and Kashmir Muslim Conference and the Kashmir Committee. The second conference by the PM of Pakistan, Chaudhary Muhammad Ali, to address the conference. One day before the All Parties Conference on Kashmir, in Kashmir, the according to Pakistan Times, Alama Mashraki said the Kashmir problem was already well known to the people of Pakistan. In his opinion, it was not proper to say anything on the question before the conference was over. However, however, he said he would oppose from every stage and also in conference any idea that might delay the solution of the problem. He declared that if the conference tried to hoodwink the people on this issue, as the government of Pakistan has been doing for the last eight years he would expose bef expose before the people and diso dissociate himself from it but if it took any decision from expediting justice to the people of Kashmir he would offer every sacrifice required from implementing the decision of the conference at the conference india's evasive tactics were condemned and it was decided that all efforts should be made to secure the right to self-determination for the people of kashmir in 1956 after a public meeting at minto park in lahore mashraki made a prediction in regards to the future of Pakistan. This is a quote from his prediction. Ye Muslims, today from this platform, I sound you a warning. Listen carefully and ponder. Sometime in the future, probably in 1970, you will be confronted with a 
perilous situation. In 1970, I see it clearly. The nation will be stormed from all sides. The internal situation would have deteriorated gravely. A panic of widespread bloodshed will sweep the nation. The frenzy of racial and provincial prejudice will grip the whole country. Zindabad and Mordabad will define your ears. Plans will be initiated to dismember the country. Take it from me that in 1970, Pakistan will be plagued with the grave threat to its sovereignty. You might actually lose if the reins of the country were not in the hands of courageous and unrelenting leadership, India will, in that grave situation, try to take advantage of your internal turmoil and devour you. All the governance of the country will fall in hands of spineless self-seekers or self-centered opportunists who might on their own accord push you to the Indian lap. I warn you about 1970. I warn you to emerge in that year. In 1947, you had a refuge to protect yourself. But in the coming days of 1970, I can clearly visualize you will have river atok on one side and the Chinese border on the other side and you will have no place to go. The outcome of the prediction made by Mashraki was proved to be true when in 1971 East Pakistan separated from West Pakistan and became Bangladesh. Moving on, in 1957 all the political disagreements in regards to Kashmir were unsuc unsuccessful and the subject remained unsettled even after 10 years. Mashraki wrote a letter to Nehru in January 1957 according to the Pakistan Times. He argued that since India had no natural or vital links to Jammu and Kashmir, her handing over this land to the people of Pakistan would be for their personal good and prosperity and that such a step would relieve both countries of the financial loss which, when retrieved, could be utilized for the good of both the peoples. Though nothing came of this letter, Mashraki decided to arrange a peaceful march into India with one million volunteers and supporters in order to bring Kashmir issue to the world's attention and force Nehru, who claimed to be great human humanitarian, to settle the issue. This frightened and alarmed the Indian government and Nehru requested Pakistan government to restrict Mashraki and his Razakars. So the government of Pakistan suppressed Mashraki's efforts. The government instructed the deputy uh, commissioner not to allow the Khaksars to set up their camps along the border for crossing over the Indian side. In the blink of an eye, Mashraki was arrested under the pretext of wrongfully confining police officials at Waga border and later also imposed section 144. This stipulated that no more than five people could gather at a public place. On March 10, 1958, Mashriki was arrested again. The reason for that is he was allegedly involved in the murder of Dr. Khan Sahib Chief, who was the minister of West Pakistan. He was later found innocent on 17th November 1958 when he left from prison. Mashriki was very sick and was suffering from cancer. Yet, in 1962, he was again arrested for conspiring to overthrow the government of President Ayub Khan. However, 
this was again a claim lacking evidence although mashruki had spent many years in jail a time came he could no longer be kept under detention his health had severely worsened and on 27th august 1963 mashruki had submitted to cancer pursuing him and passed away alama mashruki was a man whose services to his nations were no less than those of kaidiyazam gandhi or nen or nelson mandela but alas the nation failed to realize this thank you so much guys for tuning in and listening to the great scholar great leader and a great politician who struggled and fought for his country and put every single blood sweat and tears for his country thank you so much for listening guys take care thank you for watching please like subscribe and share thank you everyone and thank you alama mashruki thank you